unequal in the equality state. The life and times of Jimmy Simmons, next on Wyoming Chronicle. Hello, I'm Richard Ager. Welcome to Wyoming Chronicle. Jimmy and Simmons' life has been about many things. He's been a cowboy, an oil worker, a political candidate, a bull rider. And as a black man in Wyoming, his life has also been about being unequal in the equality state. But that's not a description of how he sees himself. Rather, it is how others have treated him in his more than four decades in Wyoming. But he's not leaving. He's here to tell this story. And as president of the Casper branch of the NAACP, the stories of other minorities in Wyoming. And we'll have all that in a few moments, but first, some background on Jimmy Simmons. Lesson number one, if you're black in the equality state, if you want to make a life here, you begin every day by confronting fear. Racism is alive and well in the United States. There is racism in Wyoming as much as we would like to not admit that. Jimmy Simmons joined us. For Jimmy, the lessons of life boil down to one thing. It's a toughness. That's the only thing I can say. It's a, a toughness that I saw growing up as a little kid in the South. I saw a man with a third grade education went on to become a multimillionaire. A lot of the guys that lived in that neighborhood probably only had like eighth grade education. But they were in business providing for their families. And his dad taught him that racial barriers were something you had to learn to move through, even when white segregationists put up roadblocks. I remember one time this big crowd of people had these ropes, they had the place blocked off and my dad drives up in this big Buick, gets out of the car, grabs the rope, throws it back and starts directing traffic. Come on through. You know, so <laughs> those are the types those are the types of incidents that I've seen uh, you know my whole childhood. After a few years working in Wyoming, Jimmy decided it was time to start his own business. His banker disagreed on racial grounds. Jimmy knew that wouldn't be the last word. He said, let me be real frank with you, Jimmy. He said, your chances of making it in the oil field, being black in Wyoming is one in a million. That's the odds that he gave me. I had been trying to get money for my rig for about three and a half years at that point. And I was, I was, I was just, I was sad and angry at the same time, so I gathered up my paperwork and walked outside in the parking lot, got in my van, I sat there for about 30 minutes, and something came to me and told me, go the opposite direction. Go to the manufacturer of the equipment and talk to them. Jimmy's oil field business was launched. He cultivated young talent, and the business grew. We were the best. There's no question in my mind. I really think that we were successful because my crews respected me. You know, that, that was our tight little group. You would win awards based on performance. We won those awards so many times that they just did away with the program. <laughs> it was just, that was amazing. <laughs> but off the rig, it was another story. We had uh, factions in the community that would uh, criticize my men for working for a black man. And it, it always comes up. It always comes up. The color thing always comes up. There were allies who saw Jimmy could make a difference and urged him to run for Wyoming's House of Representatives. He didn't win, but it was a friend in trouble who inspired Jimmy's next crusade, civil rights. His name is Mel Hamilton. He became the first black principal in the state of Wyoming. Hamilton was being harassed by fellow teachers and the superintendent. He was fighting for his job. 
And when I saw Mel, and I saw his face, I had it drooped. And we talked, and he told me what was going on in his life and what they were doing to him. The superintendent wouldn't back him up. You know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't listen to what he was saying. Subjected him to some un, unfair treatment. I started writing letters to the editor. I tried to draft the facts about what was going on and not add any, anything extra to it. Just lay it out how it's actually happening. But about 11.30, I get a phone call from someone from the school district telling me the plot that the superintendent was going through. They were going to get rid, of him, get rid of him totally. And they told me the plot, told me when it was going to happen. So Jimmy made a bold statement. I put a three-piece suit on, I put on a cape, and I went and stood out in front of the school in a one-man protest. I did that and made front-page news. His boss wasn't pleased. I lost my job. I saved his job. And uh, Casper didn't have an NAACP that was in place at that time. That led to a special election. The Casper branch elected Simmons its new president tonight. Mel Hamilton as and vice And I'm still the president at today. And joining me in the studio, Jimmy Simmons. Also with us, Professor Todd Gunther, Assistant Professor of Anthropology and History at Central Wyoming College. Welcome, both of you. Thank you. When did you start encountering some of the, I guess, issues and some of the prejudice that uh, has really marred your time here? Well, I stepped off the bus, and, and it was almost immediately in Buffalo. Um, I was off the bus maybe five minutes and a gentleman came up to me and asked me if I intend on staying around that area. And, and of course, I was 18 years old. Oh, I'm all excited, yeah, I've got a job here. And so I was at the Occidental Hotel in Buffalo, Wyoming. I walked into the lobby, called the uh, forest ranger, and um, he said, I'll be there in about 45 minutes. So I sit in the lobby, and here come this old man back, and he had about 20 people with him. They made a semicircle around me and um, they just stared at me. And so um, this little kid came up and rubbed on my skin and started to laugh, and all of them just turned around and walked out. Well, clearly not the welcome wagon. No, <laughs> no it wasn't. <laughs> well, you know, uh, Todd, that's, uh, that's some years actually after the real revolution of the civil rights era of, of the 60s. How would you describe the, the climate here at that time? in terms of you know, racial tolerance? Uh, that Buffalo Sheridan area has a long history of, of being a mixed race community. Uh, there are a lot of the soldiers stationed up there were Buffalo soldiers, black infantry, black cavalry, and a lot of them retired out of the military and stayed in that area, a place called Wildcat Creek, east of Sheridan. And then many of them found jobs in the mines, the coal mines in that part of Wyoming as well. But uh, the stores, many of the store windows in Sheridan and Buffalo on through the middle 1900s had signs in them that said, you know, no Negroes, no Mexicans, no Indians, and that type of thing. And, and that's become part of a folklore of that community. Uh, and, and did they actually use the word Negroes or was it other? Well, there were other, other, other signs like homemade signs in the railroad. Uh, yards that said nigger don't let the sundown catch you here and things like that uh, and then as late as the 1950s they still had segregated movie theaters up there and the african-american community had been using economic leverage uh, to improve their situation in that buffalo sheridan area since the 20s since before it was part of the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s and and boycotted stores and boycotted businesses and things like that very successfully, and that's what they used again to get the movie theaters uh, integrated. Um, you know, I also read that the legislature, <coughs> all the way back in 1913, had actually passed a law, gone to the trouble, passed a law, unanimously passed, by the way, making interracial marriage uh, a crime. And we had our own law that permitted segregated schools. I'm wondering, Jimmy, how long did it take you to sort of pick up on this kind of background? Well, I knew about the miscegenation laws that you're referring to, uh, <clears throat> but uh, like I said, you, you pick up on it pretty quick. It, it wasn't 
um, a subtle thing. And in living in Wyoming as long as I've lived here, um, in trying to, it seemed like the, the more I tried to fit into the community, the worse my situation got. And so I find that I have to run parallel uh, in this community. I know at the time back, uh, you know, obviously the, the minority population of blacks was very low, probably below 1%. Were you able to connect with uh, any other African Americans? Well, to be frank with you, I, I lived in a little town uh, called Lynch, Wyoming when I started out in oil. Lynch. <laughs> yeah, and that's, and that, and that's ironic, a black man living in a town called Lynch, Wyoming. But, uh, <laughs> um, you know, I'd go five, six months without seeing a black person. I was that isolated in, in that particular part of Wyoming. You know, uh, just, you know, staying on the historic front, Todd, because you've written a rather extensive article about uh, a rather shameful era, really, of, of Wyoming history, the, the lynching here. And you also wrote that the neighboring states didn't really practice it in the same way, that it was not a western mountain phenomenon, it was a, a Wyoming phenomenon. Wyoming phenomenon. The lynch rate of black men in Wyoming was about 60 times higher than the national average during the 1910s, 1920s. So we're, ta we're not talking frontier law and order issues, we're talking racial issues. And it was about 120 times higher than, say, the lynch rate of black men in Mississippi. Wow. Yeah, we, what, what we tried to do here, I think, was something that, that's been referred to as banishing, where down south they needed to keep the black community in line yep. and behaving properly because they needed them to work. Right. But in Wyoming, the population of blacks at most was about 10% when there were a lot of black soldiers stationed here. Normally it was between 1% and 3% uh, for decade after decade. And we didn't need black people here. In fact, they were competing, the handful of them who were here were competing for jobs. And there was an element of Wyoming civil society that just thought Wyoming would be a better place if it was uniformly, universally white. And, and that's what came out there. And, and, in turn, and lynching was one of the tools that they used. In Green River, they told all the entire black community, be out of here by 9 o'clock or we'll kill you and burn your homes. And um, it, it's been a very serious, serious issue here for a long time. When, when did that phase of uh, relations, if you can call it that, die down? When did lynchings end in Wyoming? The last lynching of a black man that I've been able to document in Wyoming was in Hudson in 1919. Hudson. You know, uh, Jimmy, of course, uh, you've had many jobs here, among them a cowboy. And I'm wondering, um, you know, it sounds like the cowboy life might have some sort of leveling factors, you know, uh, except perhaps in judged competition. I, I heard about one incident where a, a black rider protested his second place yeah. uh, placement finish, and he, he then uh, proceeded to take his next bull ride backwards with a suitcase. Well, that was Jesse Stahl that you're talking about. Okay. He, was, he was a bronc, saddle bronc rider. And, uh, Clearly making a point. Yeah, the judges, you know, any, anybody who knew about saddle bronc riding could clearly see that he was superior over the rest of the riders, but he placed second. And you're right, in protest of the judge's decision, uh, he rode a, a bronc backwards with a suit, holding a suitcase. And I actually have a picture of that uh, out in my car. Uh, that's, that's part of the exhibit. And so, um, uh, uh, that's but overall, though, did you feel, though, that, you know, because it's a competitive arena, that you were able to win <clears throat> some respect? Well, you know, I didn't ride much competition. Mm -hmm. uh, I rode exhibition. Uh, in fact, the first time I got on a bull was in a, during a, someone just walked up to me at a rodeo and said, "Hey, would you ride a bull?" And I was young. Yeah, I'll ride a bull. <laughs> so that's how I got started, and I won. I won. <laughs> so you know that's that's how it all started. I won. You know, um, <clears throat> you know, black cowboys, of course, uh, have been a historically little recognized, but still a large part, really, of the, of the cattle trade and, and culture uh, of the West. You know, when you were part of that, did it make you less conscious of, of color because, you know, you're all engaged in the same trade, or no. have you always been sort of been made conscious of that? You, even to this very day, I'm, 
uh, made aware of what color I am. Even in here we are in 2012, some what, 260, 270 years uh, downrange of slavery, and, and I'm still being reminded of what color I am. Um, in, in, during the rodeos, yeah, uh, I'd get in the stall, they'd, they'd announce my name, and I would hear people shouting uh, the N-word. Uh, I mean, it's, it's pretty loud, and I, uh, you, can, you can make it out pretty clear. And, uh, you know, and, and I'm out there in the arena riding, and even though my attention is on the bull, I could still hear obscenities being shouted at me. How recent was that last experience? Well, the last bull ride that I rode in for mm -hmm. like a competition ride was in the Buffalo um, Bicentennial Rodeo. That's been a long time ago. That was in 76. Okay. That was the last time I rode a bull. You know, Todd, uh, a piece of history that you actually wrote about, uh, which I found really fascinating, it's a, sort of the dark side of our equality state <laughs> status. Um, and that is when the, uh, you wrote about when the first Wyoming legislature passed, it's really its most famous act, that of, of course, granting uh, the vote to women. Um, they did it kind of for a reason, didn't they? Yeah. Uh, Fill in the dark side, if you uh, would. <laughs> a fellow named William Bright, who represented my old home, hometown, South Pass City, uh, was a Virginia native who fought for the Union during the Civil War, but was very much opposed to uh, Lincoln's efforts to give black people, or at least black men, a measure of equality. And uh, when he got down to Cheyenne, he became the president of the council, what we call the Senate today and argued very effectively for the passage of this women's suffrage bill, giving Wyoming women the first in the nation to the rights to vote, to own property, to run for political office. And when he was questioned on that later, well, in fact, the front page of the Cheyenne newspaper quoted him without a direct attribution, uh, but quoted him as saying that if the federal government is going to let the uh, niggers vote, yeah. then we're gonna ring in the women and the Chinese in Wyoming and give them the vote as well. So the, our, our nickname of the Equality State is based on a front page Cheyenne newspaper article on a foundation of racism. Little known history. <laughs> you know, um, you've of course got the cowboy experience, but also a lot of oil field experiences as we know. I do. Do, do you get a sense that, uh, I mean, are there any parallels do you think between, you know, the black cowboys uh, and, you know, um, blacks working in the, in the, in the oil fields. Did, is, is there a, a parallel in their experiences, do you think? Well, I don't think it's so much it's a parallel. You know, it's, a, it's an industry where uh, traditionally black people are not in, uh, kind of like the rodeo. You know, uh, you see more I see more blacks in the oil field now than I did back in the 70s and the 80s and even the 90s. You know, I went that, that far back. Uh, I'm going on my 39th year now. And um, Is that because of employment law changes? Uh, is that because of any kind of government action or do you think that's just the marketplace working? I think it's just the marketplace is working. You know, um, companies are, are uh, you know, our, our company uh, select talent they go off of talent and uh, experience. Like uh, I worked in, I was a foreman in uh, completion engineering, but I don't have an engineering degree, but I have a lot of experience, down hole experience. And so I was able to, uh, I was basically drafted, I was drafted in that position. I didn't apply for it. I was drafted in that position and made a foreman. And um, the very first day I was in there, they gave me 12 rigs to supervise. So, you so know, my, uh, you're my, supervising 12, ri 12 rigs, you're going not right out there? Now. Not right no, now. No, but at yeah. that point. Yeah. And uh, anybody giving you any trouble when you have to point things out to uh, other workers? No. Uh, the, the culture that I'm in now is a lot different than the culture uh, that I uh, started out in in, um, in 75 when I first broke out. Well, but when you first got your first sort of managerial level kind mm -hmm. of position, mm -hmm. was there any resistance to you exerting authority? No. No, none at all. So you it's think some smooth, progress had been made? Then. Smooth transition. Would you say? Yeah, smooth transition. Mm -hmm. Yeah.
I mean, how would you, uh, Todd, describe the, uh, well, <laughs> progress, I'm assuming, uh, in, in race relations? I mean, we've had sort of uh, a number of incidents over the years, some more recent years, that, that maybe make you question. Um, nobody's been lynched in a long time that I'm aware of. Uh, and in most parts of Wyoming, from what I've been able to see, you know, as a white guy, things are a little bit better in terms of race relations, but there's still a lot of room for improvement. I, I knew an old woman, Mabel Lindmeyer, who ranched way down in the eastern part of Wyoming back in the late 1800s, early 1900s, and she described a black man at Ebony Magazine in 1949 called the greatest Negro cattle rancher in all the West, mm -hmm. who was a neighbor of hers, Jim Edwards. Jim Edwards yeah. and, um, she described him, said, it takes a lot of courage for a black man to come and try and make his home in Wyoming. And that is still true today, even, even though things are better. We've had racial incidents in, in Jackson just two summers ago in the town square and, and other things have happened around the state. What happened and, briefly? Oh, there was a, a black high school kid who, you know, we mentioned miscegenation and interracial families. There was a black high school kid that lived over there that took his little white sister to get her an ice cream cone uh, in the town square and was nearly mobbed because, well, he was a big black boy with a little white girl. Mm -hmm. And that didn't go over too well with the people downtown Jackson. Jackson, sister. yeah. Well, you know, this, this brings us, of course, to the fact that, you know, as, as president of the Casper NAACP, uh, you do need to document uh, civil rights violations. Is it, is it, mo is it in this state mostly uh, violations against blacks or, or do you investigate all civil rights violations? We, we've investigated um, gay and lesbian situations, white, uh, Latino, black, and Native American. So we, we, it's been a diverse... Well, how busy are you? <laughs> uh, I was really busy. In fact, I had a, I had I investigated a case over in Jackson. Um, a guy was just harassed. Uh, Is it the same case you're talking? No, about? it's a different yeah. case. A different case. And, and and we we don't go out and actually look for cases. They come to us. Mm -hmm. uh, they have to fill out uh, some paperwork. It has to be signed in front of a notary and it, it's a process we go through and making a determination we're going to get in this fight or not. Well, I mean, do you get cooperation when you try to investigate? Well, <clears throat> authorities are very, very careful about uh, getting involved with the NAACP because we expose people. And one of the things that they're really uncomfortable about is, or one of the things they're really cautious about is, not getting authority exposed because it undermines the trust of the of the public, and so uh, when we get involved, if 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 the NAACP can't get it resolved, well, the next people, the next step is to get um, the FBI or the Justice Department involved. And well, you know, I, I got to point out this headline that was was just this year in uh, August, which. Uh, is the advice of uh, the NAACP here to uh, interracial couples to uh, steer clear of Wyoming. And it uh, cited a number of, uh, of problems, uh, including that uh, uh, interracial couples who travel or relocate to Wyoming, quote, have been victimized by negative attention that resulted in beatings, unjust charges, and outright intimidation. Uh, this is from 2012. Does that surprise you at all, Todd? Not particularly. Um, I think it would surprise a lot of people. There are a lot of people who live here who have a lot of different attitudes. And they feel free to express them. Hmm. Um, any second thoughts on, on, on that report that resulted in those headlines? Or do you feel that, you know, <laughs> even if you're just passing through and one spouse is white and one is black that they better watch out? Uh, I would say so. You know, I, I really would. And uh, I've investigated uh, about five cases. I'm, I'm sorry, it, was just, it sounds like the, those movies about the 1960s in Mississippi where you're just driving through some listen, town. Listen, man, this is reality. It's reality that this mm. stuff is happening in Wyoming and it's being kept quiet, hush, hush. 
Uh, I, I met with a commissioner out of a, a, a certain county here. I met with the sheriff, the commissioner, and the assistant DA with the Justice Department. We all had a sit-down meeting, talk about an incident that happened in their county. Most, most of these incidents are happening in one county. Okay. Campbell County is? Campbell County. Okay. okay. And um, we had a, a white man, a black man, walk into a, uh, a bar with his white wife. They were in there maybe two minutes, and he was in a fight. They attacked him. And then the way the law, the way the law reacted was, they gave the black man the ticket. And they said, well, why would you give the victim the ticket? Well, he was a participant. Well, Jimmy, I'm so sorry. We are right, just right out of time okay. right now. So I'm going to let that be the last, not terribly cheerful word on this, but yeah. I do thank you. All right. Thank you. Right, thank you. That is the last word for now. So our thanks to Jimmy Simmons and Professor Todd Gunther. And we're going to leave you with these images of black cowboys, courtesy of Jimmy Simmons. <laughs>